Hello, welcome to the Mana Splain podcast. I'm Connor. Today I'll be talking about the deck I built for Princess Lucariza and Riven Turnbull. So, as you can tell, both of these cards kind of suck. Princess is a 6 mana 5 4 that taps for a blue, and Riven is a 7 mana 5 7 that taps for a black. So, they're the worst rated mana dorks I've ever seen in my life. Most mana dorks that are four mana will tap for two mana or they'll tap for 15 mana or something like that. So these are horribly rated commanders. But because they're mana dorks in the command zone and they're both in the same colors, I thought they would I would put them together in one deck list because I would probably just end up doing the same thing for both of them because they're so similar. And that is just a big mana blue and black deck. So that means a lot of Krakens, a lot of Leviathans, a lot of big mana that way. And a couple payoff cards, maybe one or two payoff cards for having high mana cards. And just, you know, beating face with a bunch of Krakens. So I hope you like the deck. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment, especially if you like seeing the dog. And let's jump into the deck list. So for the deck breakdown, I have 18 theme cards, 10 sub theme, 4 synergy, and 1 protection. I didn't feel like you would need a lot of protection in this deck because people aren't likely going to kill your commanders your, or your commander because eh, they're not very useful. It's six mana, mana dork. It's not that great. And so if people kill them, that's they're either dying from a board wipe, which the protection spell in this deck won't protect from, or people are just being mean. And then to fill out the deck and make it more consistent and more fun to play, got 12 draw, 12 ramp, 10 removal, 4 board wipes, and 38 lands. So that's a lot of board wipes for a creature focused deck with all the creatures having very high mana values. But the ward wipes are won't touch any of our creatures because our creatures are either too high of a mana value or they're krakens or they're blue or whatever. So that's why our creatures will be fine and the board wipes are going to be one sided in a deck like this. Altogether, that makes 11 crossover cards, which is kind of crazy. Like, 11 crossover cards in a deck that's just big Krakens and stuff? I mean, a lot of them, a lot of the big Krakens, because they cost so much mana, will have alternate effects, which help with the crossover, which, I mean, I should have foreseen when I was starting to throw this deck together, but over 10, I'm so happy with that. So like I said, big blue creatures, and I'll go over those now. So these are all the sea monsters that will be re also removal. Hullbreaker Horror. Absolute monster of a card. Whenever you cast a spell, you get to choose one, which is return target spell you don't control to its owner's hand, or return target non land permanent to its owner's hand. So, the reason that's wild is because Hullbreaker Horror can get around uncounterable spells. Like, say someone's playing a Void Rend to blow up your Hullbreaker Horror. You could cast a spell to bounce their Void Rend back to their hand, which I mean, they could recast the Void Rend again, but still, you're just making them waste mana and you get incremental value that way, which is crazy. Brenlin the Moon Kraken, whenever you cast a spell with mana value six or greater, return target non land permanent to its owner's hand. Again, more just bouncing stuff back to people's hands, which is, you get so much tempo swing when you do that. I have an Anesh deck, which is Mono Blue Sphinxes, and that deck plays Boomerang and I of Nowhere, Snap, stuff like that. And the amount of value you can get over the course of a game by bouncing stuff back to people's hands, it, it feels like it's real removal. It's kind of crazy. Sword Coast Serpent, two mana, bounce something back to its hand. And then it's a seven mana, six, six, so you can just beat face with it. And if you cast a non-creature spell, it gets unblockable, which is awesome. And then Slin Voda, you can cast for 10 mana, and then it will return all creatures who there's owner hands that aren't Murpho, Krakens, Leviathans, Octopus, or Serpents. So... Slim Voda will keep all of your giant sea monsters on the field and bounce everything else. It, 10 mana for an 8-8 is really expensive, but also being a board wipe makes it so worth it. These are the two sea monsters that care about connecting for damage. Rexel the Risen Deep, 5-8 with Island Walk and Swamp Walk, which is crazy. But whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you get to cast an or sorcery from that player's graveyard. You don't, without paying its mana cost, then you exile it. So say someone has an extra turn spell they put in the bin, or even just a rampant growth, cultivate, uh, a removal spell, maybe something like a dismantling wave. You, It's so much value. And Island Walk, Swamp Walk, there's going to be someone that has an island or a swamp at the table because of dual lands and the triomes and everything like that. So Rexel will be able to connect basically every game for free and get you so much value. I love Rexel. I've kind of wanted to make a Rexel commander deck, but it's kind of hard with him being like this and i don't know it was hard to find a way to put the get deck together in a way i enjoyed i was thinking about making uh what's his name 
Phoenix, uh, God of Deception deck, throwing Rexel in there and having a lot of fun that way. But yeah, I love Rexel, such a cool card. And then Spawning Kraken. Whenever a Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent you control deals combat damage to a player, you make a 9 9 Kraken. So all of your sea monsters just make more sea monsters which is absolutely ridiculous and is going to get so out of hand. And you can, you have, say you have a Kraken out or a Serpent out, you got some stuff out, then you cast this, you connect, you immediately become the threat and the only way they can stop you is probably a board wipe because the turn you play this, you're going to be attacking with a couple Krakens anyways, making two or three tokens. Spawning Kraken is, a, it's so powerful. Then we have all of the sea monsters that care about being unblockable. Deep Sea Kraken being one of my favorite cards of all time. Uh, you can pay three man to suspend it. And then whenever an opponent casts a spell, you get to remove a time counter from it if it's suspended. So you can easily get this thing out so fast because people are just aren't gonna not play their spells because you have this in suspend. And then you have a giant six, six unblockable haste Kraken, which is crazy. Uh, because Suspend gives it haste, which that is, I love how Suspend gives creatures haste. It's so awesome. Stormtide Leviathan makes it so that most of the creatures in this deck won't be able to attack, but your opponent's creatures won't be able to attack either. So as long as you have a couple of the Island Walk creatures in the deck, maybe some flying stuff, Stormtide Leviathan makes it so that you're the only one able to dish out damage anymore. And being an 8-8 beater, you only need is one or two other big beaters and you can quickly close out a game. It's awesome. And then Tromo Kratos makes it so that when it attacks, all of your opponent's creatures need to block it if they want to block it. So either you hit them for eight with Tromo Kratos or all your other creatures get to hit them. All these cards are awesome and I love e how each one gives you a different level of unblockable in their own way. These sea monsters are kind of crazy though because they'll tap down all of your opponent's creatures for the next two untap steps so that even without haste, they'll get a free attack in that's unblocked. Like that's kind of crazy. And so you, the turn you play them, you you get a free attack. And then the turn after that, you also get a free attack. That is insane. And with Icebreaker Kraken, I'm putting a bunch of snow lands in the deck. I'm putting both snow duels in blue and black, and then all the basics are snow basics. So Icebreaker Kraken could cost like six, four, six less mana when you go to cast. So instead of being 12 mana, it could only be like eight or six. And an 8-8 for 6 mana that taps on all your opponent's creatures, that's kind of crazy. And then you could return 3 snow lands you control to your hand to bounce Cr Icebreaker Kraken back to your hand to then replay him to freeze everybody up again. Like, that's crazy. These cards are so cool. Icebreaker Kraken is amazing, though. This card is awesome. The last group of cards in this category tend to not be sea monsters like the Leviathan Serpent type of creatures. But I needed some good card draw. Sire of Stagnation. Is great card draw. Demir, it's awesome. Arcanus the Omnipotent, another great card draw card. And then Nezahal being technically a sea monster and an, another great card draw card. Also has built-in protection on itself to discard three cards and you get to blink it to protect itself. All these cards are great. And Arcanus the Omnipotent is amazing card draw. I love that card so much. And then the last ones here, uh, Shieldred, Gyruda, and Artisan are all cards that can reanimate stuff from your graveyard or cheat stuff out in one way or another while kairuda artisan and shard all have a cast or etb trigger all of these cards are great uh i love the cheating out of creatures that you can do with shield or kairuda and artisan that's super nice artisan being nine mana then you could get one of your eight or ten mana things out of your graveyard with it is fantastic um it doesn't cast the thing from your graveyard it just returns it so if you have a creature in your graveyard that has a cast trigger unfortunately artisan doesn't do that but that's okay and then shard of the nightbringer when you cast it you just get to half somebody's life total and then you get all that life loss like that is insane shard of the nightbringer is a wild card so because we have such big mana intensive creatures the sub theme of the deck is cheating them out either putting them into our graveyard and reanimating them or just cheating them out of our hand so i'll go over what those cards are now these are all cards to cheat the big creatures out of your hand or the top of your library to the battlefield. So Omniscience and One the Multiverse and Quicksilver Amulet, they can all cheat something out of your hand. Quicksilver Amulet and One the Multiverse can only do it once a turn, but Omniscience for 10 mana lets you cast all of your spells for free, which is crazy. Omniscience also helps you cast Kicker. It helps you pay Kicker costs and multi-kicker costs easier because since the casting cost of the card is free, you, you have your mana freed up to be able to pay for Kicker, buyback, and all that stuff easier. So Omniscience is very cool with that kind of synergy. One with the multiverse only lets you Omniscience once per turn. 
but you can play lands and cast spells from the top of your library and you can cast something for free off the top of your library as well. So one with the multiverse gives you that extra kind of juice, which is super useful. Quicksilver Amulet costs four and then for four and you tapping it, you drop a creature from your hand onto the battlefield, which is amazing, especially if you have big creatures with high costs that have really good ETB effects. That is just e great. You don't have to cast them and you can just get them out. And then Jacob is really interesting. You can tap him to draw a card, then you exile a card from your hand face down and you, and you can look it at, but your opponents can't see it. And then, you can pay six to transform him and he turns into an enchantment that once during each of your turns you can cast one of those exiled cards face down for free which is crazy and also the enchantment exiles the top card of your library at the beginning of your upkeep so if you have ways to manipulate the top card of your library once a turn you can just drop these massive bombs you can maybe hit on omniscience under jacob and then just drop that and jacob only costing two mana you get him out early good card draw even though it's technically not it, it's not making your hand size bigger you still get to put big spells under jacob and then later on you flip them and you just drop bombs with them it's so awesome and with the reprinting of necromancy we can run it in decks again because it isn't a gajillion dollars and some really old card uh necromancy was recently reprinted in a commander deck uh the wording got changed or the oracle text just got updated on a card so it's really wordy but animate dead and necromancy basically do the same thing where you cast them and then a creature from any graveyard comes onto the battlefield enchanted by that enchantment and then if that enchantment ever leaves the creature gets sacrificed necromancy can be cast at flash speed um and then you'll have to sacrifice the uh, permanent at the beginning of the next end step or cleanup step i guess so if you want the flash speed of it unfortunately you don't get to keep it but in this deck you're not going to be often flashing necromancy out you're just going to be grabbing a creature and if there's a really big powerful creature in one of your opponent's graveyards animate dead and necromancy can steal it which is fantastic and then the grim captain's locker is really interesting because you can tap it to surveil one so you can look at the top card of your library leave it on top or put it into your graveyard so you can help put big creatures into your graveyard that you'd want to be able to cast later and then again you can Later on, you could tap it to give creatures in your graveyard escape for four mana and then exiling four other cards from your graveyard. And that's a cast trigger, or that is casting the creature. So if you have cre big, expensive creatures with that have high costs that have cast triggers or something, you can then escape them out, which is casting them, and then boom, you get like you get a big creature for four mana and four cards instead of like 12 mana. So Grim Captain's Locker, Animate Dead Necromancy, they're all great for getting being able to cheat your creatures out of your graveyard. These cards are awesome. And then finally, all of the creatures in the deck that can reanimate stuff from graveyards back to the battlefield. Gyrud is a little bit different here because it can only animate an even-costed card from the four cards each player mill, but you can steal one of your opponent's creatures with it. So for the synergy category, since we're trying to cheat some stuff out of our graveyard and we have a couple cards that care about the top card of our library, I thought why not do both at the same time, manipulate the top card of the library and cheat stuff and help get stuff into our graveyard so we can cheat it out. So the cards I decided for the Synergy category are Notion Rain, Sinister Starfish, Think Tank, and Wonder. Wonder will give all of our creatures flying if we're able to get into the graveyard, and with this deck, with a couple of surveil effects I put in here, that won't be a problem. Think Tank, every upkeep lets us surveil one. Sinister Starfish, you can tap it to surveil one. And then Notion Rain, draws us two, surveils two, draws us two cards, and deals two damage to us. So with Notion Rain, we can also help throw some stuff into the bin. All, with all these cards here, it'll be a lot easier to put our big threats into the graveyard without accidentally throwing one of the necromancy animate dead effects into the graveyard. And because either of our commanders only can tap for one mana, that's all they do, there's only one protection card I could think of for adding to the deck, and that's Lightning Greaves. It makes our commanders have haste so they can tap for mana as soon as they enter, and we can also slide it over onto a creature that would need more protection than them after we cast it. So we can slide onto our commander, give it haste, cast one of our really big threats and then put the lightning greaves over on the big threat because we only need to give the commander haste the one time lightning greaves are great here they're a phenomenal card they're so good i love this card hate playing against it but i love it when i have it but because we're in demir we have amazing card draw but i decided to not go for the sign in blood knight's whisper type effects and more of the thirst effects so that we can discard cards in addition to drawing cards so that we can put select cards in our graveyard for reanimation purposes so to start off this category these are the looting effects unctus is a little different than the other cards because he has other blue creatures you control have when this creature becomes tapped draw then discard a card 
And that's important because when, when your creatures attack, if they don't have vigilance, they'll tap. And our commanders are blue. Our commander is blue. So whenever you tap them for mana, you can draw then discard. It'll help you fill your graveyard and filter through, get rid of the cards you don't need, and so on. And then if you happen to have Unctus and Likeness Looter or Rona out, you get to loot twice whenever you tap them to loot. It's fantastic. And Likeness Looter, if you really want them to, you can pay X and they become the copy of Tar Creature card in your graveyard with mana value X except it has flying in this ability. So if we ever want to copy one of the really big threats in our graveyard, Likeness Looter can. You want to get Shieldred or something like that. Likeness Looter is perfect for that. It's so good. I decide to add all of the Thirst cards because they all draw three, discard two, or discard one if you meet a certain requirement. Uh, there aren't a lot of enchantments in this deck, I don't think, so Thirst for Meaning is probably going to be discard two every time. But if you don't hit anything that you really want to discard in your graveyard, any creatures that you think you'll be able to reanimate, for Thirst for Knowledge and Thirst for, for Discovery, you can just discard the basic land or the artifact, and you only have to discard one, making it actual card advantage. Some more effects like that. Factor Fiction, an opponent gets to put the five cards you reveal into two piles. Put a pile into your hand, a pile into your graveyard. So you might lose an important piece that you might want in your hand and might have to go to the graveyard, but you get the choice. So if they're probably going to put into a pile of three and a pile of two. And so four mana, draw three cards, mill two is basically what this card is going to be in this deck. And that is an amazing rate. Frantic Search is essentially draw two cards, discard two cards, and it's free because you untap three lands. But if you have a land that taps for more than one mana, it's you're positive on mana. So it's like a faithless looting, but you get mana back. It's kind of wild. And then Notion Rain, I showed it earlier. The card's great. The Surveil effect here is awesome. And then these are the creatures that will draw us cards. They're all fantastic. Arcanacy Omnipotent drawing three cards a turn is ridiculous. The ramp for this deck is pretty standard for a Demir deck. A little bit of artifact ramp. But because we're in blue, we do have access to one card. That's really fun. I'll show that in a bit. And because we're in black and we're doing big creatures, we have access to a card that I've always wanted to put in a deck, but I've never been able to for one reason or another. That card being Heartless Summonings. So Heartless Summonings I've always wanted to put in a deck, but I've never found a deck that I was able to. But this is it. All of our creatures have big powers and toughnesses, and they cost a lot of mana. So the power and toughness reduction is totally worth it to make them cost two less. Our big eight mana sea monsters now become six. Something like Arcanus the Omnipotent, six mana now becomes four. Like that value is crazy. And for our commanders, it makes our commanders cost two less. And our commanders are just mana dorks. It's not like we're going to be attacking with them. So because of that, making them cost two less is even more value. And then in addition to that, Semblance Anvil, we can exile a creature from our hand and then our creatures cost two less to cast as well. These cards are gonna help cast the big stuff, make it a lot easier to cast the big stuff and also help us get our commanders out so that we can use them for more mana. The blue card I'm excited about though is Dreamscape Artist. So it does non-bow with Heartless Summonings, unfortunately, because it's a 1-1. But Dreamscape Artist, you can pay three and tap it and then discard a card, sacrifice a land, and then search your life for two basic land cards, put them on the battlefield. So it is discarding a card and sacking a land, but then you go get two lands. So it's like you're playing a land out of your hand. You essentially yeah, turn one of the cards into your hand into a land it's kind of crazy it's a really good card i've played it before in maldrotha which in maldrotha it's just not fair but yeah it's awesome and the discarding and sacrificing are unfortunately part of the cost so you can't cheat that by not having any cards in hand but besides that dreamscape artist is going to help you ramp so well and then in addition to dreamscape artist the other cards that can get us some basics are solemn burnished and wayfarer's bobble they all help us get basics, and if we want to, we can reanimate Solemn or Burnished Heart to get even more land out and help us ramp even further. These are the two mana rocks that will produce the colored mana we need. Uh, Arcane Signet, Demir Signet, they're great. Talismans, I used to not be so hot on, but I like them a lot now. The little bit of life loss is usually not that important, but they can still tap for a colorless if the light loss, life loss does become important, so their flexibility is fantastic. Also, the ability to tap it for the colorless to feed the Demir Signet. I've done that all the time. It's great. The colorless producing small mana rocks in the deck. Soul Ring, obviously putting it in here. Big mana deck and just a commander deck. Soul Ring is absolutely busted. Prismatic Lens uh, can filter for a color if we need it to, but you're almost always going to be tapping this just for the colorless. And the Never Flowing Chalice. So because this is a big mana deck, you could potentially pump the multi kicker a couple times and then get three charge counters on this thing and then it starts tapping for three mana i love everflowing chalice probably one of my favorite mana rocks next to prismatic lens 
So being in blue black means we have access to absolutely phenomenal removal, uh, some repeatable removal, as well as some instant speed stuff. It's unfair how good the blue and black removal is, even though I know that's their thing. So these are the creatures you saw earlier, but they're such good removal. The fact that Brynlin and Hullbreaker Horror are both repeatable is crazy. And Sword Coast Serpent being a removal and then a threat is fantastic. These are the black removal spells, Infernal Grasp and Walk the Plank are both amazing. Walk the Plank is probably my favorite black removal spell because unless you're going up against the Professor, this will kill basically any like everybody's creatures. And then Feed the Swarm, the life loss can be pretty detrimental sometimes, but the ability to uh, destroy a creature or enchantment, that flexibility is so worth the life loss. And to round off this category, some very good blue removal, Snap is fantastic the ability to untap your lands and if you have any lands untapped for more than one mana you are positive on mana snap is absolutely crazy i run it in one of my popper decks my only popper deck and it's it just it works so well and then raven form the, again the flexibility can hit an artifact or a creature and it's exile which is kind of busted can hit a one ring if you really need it to something like that and the foretell you can pay the two now pay the one later love raven form it's so good and finally, Pong and Fine Rapid Hybridization, the blue versions of Path to Exile and Swords of Plowshares. Not really, but replacing someone's creature with a 3-3 is, for one mana at instant speed, is insane. So because we're going to be spending a crap load of mana on these giant creatures, I we could not afford the board wipes to actually hit our stuff as well. So I made sure that the board wipes could only really affect our opponents, and if they affect us, it actually could be positive. So Displacement Wave, probably the best board wipe in this deck because we can dump four or five mana into X and it won't hit any of our creatures, which is great. The creatures it would hit would be like, uh, was it Solemn Simulacrum, which we're happy to replay. Yeah, Displacement Wave's great here. But then Whelming Wave, Inundate, and Slinvoda, they can all bounce the Artisan of Kozilek, the creature from Warhammer 40k that'll have someone's life total. But we want those creatures back in our hand so we can recast them and get those cast stringers again while leaving all of the big sea creatures out that can just sit there and hit face so even though they will be able to bounce some of our creatures the creatures they're bouncing we're okay with going back to our hand so this deck is running a lot of basics because of solemn burnished dreamscape artist wayfarers bobble and the fact that we could reanimate the the burnished heart or the soul and some lacrum or the dreamscape artist letting them die so that's one thing and they're all snow but there are some other lands in this deck, one of which I can't believe how exp I can believe how expensive it is now. But I hope Wizards of the Coast reprint these into the ground because they're such an amazing land for casual decks, and I really hope they print, like reprint them so many times that they drop to like two dollars a piece because they I really wish they would sit there. Those lands being the surveil lands from Murders at Karlov Manor, or yeah. They're amazing. They're so good. Uh, when they first dropped, I couldn't stop singing their praises enough. And I guess other people agreed with me because Undercity Sewers is like 16 bucks right now. And uh, when they first came out, they were all like two, three bucks a piece. And now they're all, I think they're all over 10, which is really unfortunate. I really hope that they get reprinted in pre-cons and just all over the place because they're really good lands and they enter tapped so they're more casual in that way but they're fetchable which is i understand why they're they're costing a pretty penny at the moment but in the right deck surveil one on a land can be equivalent of drawing a card so these lands are fetchable and essentially will draw you a card i understand why they're so expensive right now it just sucks because i wish more people would have easier access to these lands because they're so amazing and I was so happy when they were printed. They are, they're just super great, especially in green decks where you can get them off a of Farseek or a Nature's Lore or three visits, something like that. They're just, they're so good. And then I'm also running some other little spicier lands. Bonders Enclave, both of our commanders have five power. So even if we have Heartless Act out, our commanders will be four power so that we can tap Bonders Enclave, draw a card. Tomb Fortress, we can, pay six because you have to tap it and pay the five to act to mill four cards and then return a creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield so for six mana and getting rid of and exiling this land we can bring a creature back which is great rivendell 
You can pay two to scry two, only active if you have a legendary creature. This is just a little bit of additional value we could squeak out if we really needed it, which is awesome. And then I say this in all of my videos, but Morphic Pool from the, the, the Battle Bond Lands. Wizards, please put the Battle Bond Lands in the multiplayer products. They're designed for multiplayer formats, and especially the Commander decks. These should be in all of those pre-cons. Thank you. I had a really difficult time making cuts for this deck because picking one how many giant sea monsters I wanted and which sea monsters I wanted was quite difficult, but I think I managed to cut it down to a way where I'm quite happy with it. I cut braids because the issue with this deck is none of the threats are so insanely massive that letting all of our opponents drop a threat before us would like make up for it, unfortunately. Doom Whisperer, Whisperer, the pay to life surveil to is awesome, but I'm just, there's not a lot of ways to recuperate that life. So not running it, I think is okay. Mind Leech Mass, I'm not a fan of stealing cards from other people's hands like that. It just kind of feels scummy, but it is a very strong effect. Certain of the Awning Depths, this is probably the 101st card in the deck because it gives all of our sea monsters unblockable except by other sea monsters. So I, I just, I couldn't find another card to cut for this one, even though it is an amazing card. It, and it also, it also is a little more expensive because it's so good. So yeah, it is definitely the 101st card in this deck. And then the 102nd card in this deck is Fleet Swallower. But I didn't want to put any mill effects in the deck because if we mill any of our Necromancy Shieldred-like effects, we don't really have ways to get those back because those are the only reanimation we have in the deck. And with Surveil, you get to control what you're putting in, but with Mill, because Fleet Swallow, you can target yourself, it's just you don't have any control, and the top half of your library goes away, and then there's a 50-50 chance any one card you want to find in your hand will go to your graveyard, which is unfortunate, but Fleet Swallow is an awesome card. I love it in other decks. The other cards that didn't quite make it off the chopping block, uh, Energy Tap, it is amazing because all of our we have big creatures with high mana, so energy tapping them for more mana seems very useful. Not really a big fan of a ritual effect, um, and also a lot of the cards in this deck required colored mana pips, so making a bunch of colorless mana, we might not be able to use all of it. That'd be unfortunate. Otherworldly Gaze, I, I was close to putting this in over the three mana enchantment. That surveils once per turn because for three mana this will surveil six times and the other card wouldn't you need six three mana and then six turns for it to veil, surveil six times but i kind of like the set it and forget itness of the enchantment and otherworldly gaze you can i don't know it's really close i think otherworldly gaze is amazing in this deck but i don't know it's so close uh, decanter i'm not putting any of the no max hand size cards in this deck because we want to have to discard some cards sometimes so that we have ways to get the big threats in the graveyard quest for ula's temple i don't think there's enough creatures maybe there's enough creatures in this deck to get the upkeep thing off enough plus with the top deck manipulation it's just if you don't get it a couple times through like the rng-ness of it you're going to be super screwed. So unless you really have, I wouldn't run this card in a deck unless our commander can manipulate the top card of our library super consistently that way. But yeah, it is very powerful if you're running a Kraken deck and you can do that though, or just a sea monster deck. Quest for Lula's Temple is amazing. And then Planar Bridge. I was really considering running this, but then I realized I would just go get Omniscience every time and that feels really gross. It is six mana to play it, eight mana to activate it, but just... Planar Bridge getting Omniscience every time kind of sounds boring, and I just wasn't into that play pattern. So what'd you think of the deck? Uh, I was really worried when I saw these commanders because six, six mana taps for a blue or seven mana taps for a black. Not great. They're pretty terrible rates, honestly. But I think I was... I'm pretty happy with what I was able to kind of work build and work out with of these commanders. I don't know how else you could build them to be super great. There is ways to... Because, they, because the princess can tap for a blue, if you put a freed from a reel or a penman's aura on her, you can untap her an infinite number of times, and then maybe you could get Unctus out, mill your whole deck fast as Oracle and win. There's stuff like that you could do, but I didn't want to do a really gross combo like that. It isn't Demir, so it'd be super easy to tutor up. But yeah, I just didn't want to do that kind of two-card combo win with your commander. Just not the way I like to play the game. But what would you do with these commanders? I'd love to hear what your thoughts about them are. So these are all my socials. Twitter is when I post when these videos go live. And I 
I might start doing other stuff on Twitter. I don't know. Um, let me know if there's if you even follow me on Twitter. Uh, TikTok, I'm going to start doing content on TikTok and cross-posting that to Reddit. And then Architect and Moxfield are where these, all of these deck lists live. So thanks for watching, and as always, get building splainers. Uh, that is so 